Good morning. You can open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 1, if you would. It's hard for me to find just the right words that can adequately express the privilege that I feel this morning to speak about the one that I love the most, my Savior, Jesus Christ, to a group of people that I love the most, the members of Covenant Fellowship Church. And as I grow older, that sense of privilege only deepens as I ponder again what Christ has done for me in the gospel, and as I ponder how you as a church have helped Jill and my family and me grow in the gospel. See, it's a beautiful thing when a church stays centered on Christ and helps each other grow in Christ. And it is Jesus Christ who is our topic today. The title of my message is The Doctrine of Jesus Christ, and we're going to be looking at two major sections of our statement of faith, the person of Jesus Christ and the saving work of Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 1, let's read the first four verses. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. May God bless the preaching of his, his holy word. Bill mentioned a couple of weeks ago that the first thousand years of church history are filled with theologians and church leaders working out the orthodox theology that we find in our statement of faith today. And one of those historic events was the Council of Nicaea, which was convened on May 20th, 325 A.D., and the main agenda item for that council was to debate the divinity of Jesus Christ. A man by the name of Arius had spread false teaching that Christ was not co-eternal with God the Father, and therefore he was not fully divine. Alexander was assigned to be the principal spokesperson to argue for the full deity of Christ, and a man by the name of Eusebius argued for the Arian view. At the beginning of the council, it seems that many of the men were not very well informed on the issue. However, their neutrality rapidly evaporated when Arius' views were explained more fully by Eusebius. As he proceeded to explain the Arian position that denied the full deity of Christ, the men in that room, they became so angry that they grabbed his notes out of his hands and they tore them to pieces. Now, on the face of it, that may seem like a rather extreme reaction, but one must keep in mind that there were men in that room who were bearing scars of persecution because of their devotion to Christ. The 5th century historian Theodoret writes, Paul, who was there from Neo Caesarea, had been deprived the use of both of his hands because of the use of a red-hot iron. Other leaders in that room had their right eye gouged out, while other men sitting there had lost their right arm. In short, writes Theodoret, Theodoret the council looked like an assembled army of martyrs. Why would these men, some of whom were bearing scars for their devotion to Christ, why would they fiercely contend for the full deity of Christ? Because they knew that an orthodox Christology regarding the person and work of Jesus Christ is foundational to all of theology. J.I. Packer writes this, Christology is the true hub around which the wheel of theology revolves. 
and to which its separate spokes must, must each be correctly anchored if the wheel is not to get bent. Historic Christianity's most distinctive convictions are decisively shaped and determined by a proper understanding of the identity of Christ. Our statement of faith is filled with Christianity's most distinctive convictions, which are decisively shaped and determined by a proper understanding of the person, life, death, resurrection, ascension, and consummation of Jesus Christ, which is why we write this in our online introduction to our statement of faith. The statement of faith also makes explicit what is foundational to our doctrinal commitments, the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is the primary passion and the driving influence in our church's common life, worship, and outreach. So what is our primary passion as a church and as a denomination? It is Christ and him crucified. What is the driving influence for our common life together? Living for the glory of Jesus Christ. What motivates our outreach to the lost? Telling people about the good news of Jesus Christ. You see, Christology is foundational to our doctrinal commitments as a church. And because theology determines how we live, Christology is foundational to how we live our common life together. Now, our text is one of many in Scripture that give us a proper understanding of the identity of the person of Christ and his work in the gospel. And the author of Hebrews, he begins this letter by telling us that God's progressive revelation is completed in Jesus Christ. Look back at verse 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son. The point is, in these last days, no more revelation is needed to supplement what God has fully revealed to us in His Son because Christ has fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies that pointed to Him, and all the promises of God find their yes and amen in Him. And what God has said to us by His Son does not contradict or replace what He spoke to us in the Old Testament. Rather, it completes God's, God's progressive revelation. See, Christology is foundational not only for us to understand this re progressive redemptive story in our Bibles, it's foundational to the primary passion and driving influence here at Covenant Fellowship Church. So, three reasons why Christology is foundational. Number one, Christology is foundational to knowing the person of Jesus Christ, to knowing the person of Jesus Christ. In the person of Jesus Christ, we see two natures, one divine and one human, which are inseparably joined together. Now, based on Scripture, the Council of Nicaea decisively concluded that Jesus Christ is fully God. And our text gives us one biblical evidence for the deity of Christ. Look at the second half of verse 2. So we know that God has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. Because Jesus is the one through whom God created the world, we know that Jesus existed before creation, and therefore He is the pre-existent Son of God. Our statement of faith says that He is the eternal Son. So, sorry Arius, you were wrong. And verse 3 gives further proof of the deity of Christ. Look at verse 3. He, meaning Christ, is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Jesus Christ is the exact imprint of the divine nature of God. And as Bill taught, Jesus is also the almighty God who upholds the universe by the word of his power. See, Scripture reveals the full deity of Christ 
And we say it this way in our statement of faith. In the fullness of time, God the Father sent His eternal Son, the second person of the Trinity, into the world as Jesus Christ. And when God the Father sent His eternal Son into the world, Christ, through the incarnation, took on a fully human nature. The Gospel of Luke tells us that He was conceived by the Holy Spirit. Mark's Gospel says that He was born of the Virgin Mary. And when he did, when, when, when in this stunning act of humility, Jesus becomes a man. And he takes on full human nature with all of its attributes and complexities and frailties and temptations. And yet, as Hebrews 4.15 says, he was without sin. John's Gospel says, and we, we read it earlier, the Word became flesh revealing that the divine, eternal Son took on a full human nature and thus now and forevermore subsists subsists in two natures which are inseparably joined together in the one person, Jesus Christ. It's captured this way in our statement of faith. In this union, two whole, perfect, and distinct natures were inseparably joined together in the one person of the divine Son, without confusion, mixture, or change. See, that foundational truth that we just read, that Christ exists as one person in two distinct, inseparable natures, is very important in avoiding historical heresies about Christ that move from two natures to Jesus being two persons. That's Nestorianism, for example. Or from one person to Jesus just having one nature, like Eutychianism. It also explains how Jesus, on the one hand, can uphold the universe by the word of his power, and on the other hand, hunger and thirst and grow weary and be tempted and and die. Are you weary this morning? God knows it, because Christ experienced weariness, and He moves towards you to strengthen you? Are you carrying a a lingering sadness or grief? Jesus feels it. Jesus experienced sadness. He wept at Lazarus' tomb, and so he, He meets you in your sadness, and He is here today to comfort you. Are you lonely? Jesus gets it. On the night before his death at his arrest, all of his friends abandoned him. And because of his death, this morning if you are here in Christ, he calls you a friend. And he meets you in your loneliness. Those temptations you face daily, he understands every one of them. Because he was tempted in every way, and yet, Scripture tells us, he was without sin. And so when we do sin, He does not condemn you because He offers forgiveness to you because of His perfect sacrifice for your sin. See, this this two-nature doctrine of the person of Jesus Christ is not merely an abstract reality, but was the means by which God effected salvation for His people. The Son of God, in obedience to the Father, acts in and through both of His natures to accomplish salvation for sinners like you and me. So let me ask you, how do we know Jesus? He is the Son of God incarnate, fully God and fully man, and the only one who is able to be our all-sufficient Savior. Listen to how we say it in our statement of faith. As God's incarnate Son, Our Lord Jesus Christ inaugurated the kingdom of God, fulfilling God's saving purposes in all Old Testament prophecies about the one to come. He is the seed of the woman. He is the seed of Abraham, the prophet like Moses, the priest after the order of Melchizedek, the son of David, the suffering servant, and God's appointed Messiah. See, brothers and sisters, there are places in this statement of faith that just preach 
And so read it and preach these truths to yourself. Now, we must theologically know the person of Jesus Christ rightly, as one person with both divine and human nature, to understand his work in the gospel rightly. John Stott says, if the essence of the atonement is substitution, the theological inference is that it is impossible to hold to the historic doctrine of the cross without holding to the historic doctrine of Jesus Christ as the one and only God-man and mediator. The person and work of Christ belong together. If he was not who the apostles say he was, then he could not have done what they say he did. The incarnation is indispensable to the atonement. See, we believe that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man, and therefore only he could accomplish what his Father sent him to do. Which leads to the second point. Christology is foundational to understand the work of Jesus Christ. To understand the work of Jesus Christ. Our text clearly speaks of his work in the second half of verse 3. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. The one who upholds the universe by his power is the one who humbled himself, becoming like a man to serve as our mediator, dying a substitutionary death on the cross, and by so doing, he made purification for all of our sins. You see, Jesus, he, he humbled himself in life and in death, both of which were substitutionary in nature. See, acting in and through both his human and divine natures, only Jesus, who was tempted in every way and was without sin, only he could offer a perfect sacrifice on the cross, in our place, making purification for all our sins. The Old Testament prophet Isaiah says it this way. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. See, Scripture teaches the penal substitutionary nature of the atonement. That word penal, it means penalty or punishment. So penal substitution means this. Someone takes your punishment for you. You may have seen the picture out of the nation of Miramar this past week. As you know, protests, citizens are protesting in that nation against the military takeover of the government. And in this picture, there is a crowd gathered protesting, and on the other side of them are government soldiers, rifles drawn, seemingly ready to fire into the crowd. And a nun comes walking into the middle between the soldiers and the protesters. She faces the soldiers, she gets down on her knees, and she stretches out her arms and she says, kill me instead. See, that picture from this week, it gives us just a bit of a glimpse of what happened at the cross. Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross, and he looked to his Father and he said, kill me instead. The punishment that is theirs for their many sins, give it to me instead. The righteous wrath that they deserve for their transgressions poured out upon me, poured all out upon me instead. See, the penal substitutionary of the atonement is the heart of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And because critics have attacked it for centuries, it is one that we must fiercely protect and defend, which is why we affirm it in our statement of faith and protect our churches with it in our statement of faith, saying this. In his substitutionary death, on behalf of his people, Christ offered himself by the Spirit as a perfect sacrifice, which satisfied the demands of God's law by paying the full penalty for 
their sins. On the cross, Christ bore our sins, took our punishment. He propitiated God's wrath against us, which means He appeased God's wrath for us. He vindicated God's righteousness, and by so doing, we are imputed with the righteousness of Christ and purchased our redemption in order that we might be reconciled to God. See, brothers and sisters, there are places in this statement of faith that just preach. And I want to commend that section I just read to you. Read it every day and preach the gospel to yourself. One of the things that we've talked about in the history of our church is we want to be a people who consistently preach the gospel to ourselves. Let us not lose that. And let us use this statement of faith and that section in particular to continue to preach the gospel to ourselves. Because we are a people covenant fellowship who believe Jesus' words that he cried from the cross, it is finished. And when God the Father raised him from the dead three days later, vindicating Jesus' identity and saving work as the Messiah, we believe that the Father in that moment was pleased to accept Jesus' sacrifice as a complete sacrifice for sin. See, we believe that no further sacrifice for sin is needed. We believe that there is no good work that we can do that can be added to what Christ accomplished on the cross because His atoning work is is completely, entirely efficacious, which is a gift of God's grace that we receive through repentance and faith. We believe that when Jesus sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, he looked at his Father and he said, job done. The work of salvation is done. And this is why the, the primary passion and influence in this church is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because He paid it all. Our sin that left a crimson stain, He washed it by His blood. He washed it all away white as snow. Now I would guess that most, if not all of you, know this truth that I just preached. So the question is, how does Christology, how does it shape how we live. That leads to my third point. Christology is foundational to live for Christ. Christology is foundational to live for Christ. To live for Christ means that we are a people who stay centered on Christ because His work today continues as our prophet and priest and king. As our great high priest, Hebrews 7 verse 25 says that Jesus now lives to make intercession for us, constantly pleading with the Father on our behalf. Dane Ortland writes about that. Christ's intercession reflects how personal our rescue is. He died for you. He rescued you. He now lives and He's praying Personally, he's interceding personally for you. From the Father's right hand, Jesus, he pours out his Holy Spirit upon us, empowering us to be victorious over sin and Satan and to do the good works that he's prepared for us to do. And when we do sin, 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 says that Jesus Christ is our advocate standing at our side, standing right at our side, constantly advocating our cause before the Father. As Bunyan said, Satan must be speechless after a plea from our advocate. That's good news, isn't it? You see, when we are prone to wander, we are held fast because Christ is a sure and steadfast anchor of our souls. When we are perplexed and we're not sure what God is doing, we are people who are not driven to despair because we have a king who is governing the affairs of our lives, and not just our lives, he's governing all the nations as well. When we are rejected and marginalized for being Christians, we are not forsaken because we know that nothing will separate us 
from the love of God that we have in Christ Jesus. When we are sorrowful because of loss and suffering, we are people who are yet always rejoicing because we have a great high priest who who in every way sympathizes with our weakness and even bears our sorrow with us. You see, to live for Christ, we must be people who stay centered on Christ. Let Let me end with this. The world that we live in defines itself by what it is against. But we want people walking into this church to know what we are for. And what are we for? We are for the supremacy of Christ in all of life. We are for Jesus being exalted in our homes, in our relationships, in our workplaces and communities. We are for seeking the glory of the Lord and not our own fame in all that we do. By God's grace, we want to pursue an abiding joy in Christ, an overflowing gratitude for Christ, a growing obedience to Christ, and a generosity, a sacrificial generosity motivated by Christ because all of those are uh, tangible expressions that we live for Christ. Why do we want to be known for this? Because Jesus paid it all. All. All to him, brothers and sisters, we owe. Our sin that left a crimson stain. By his blood, he's washed all those sins away, white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid our debt and raised our lives up from the dead. Hallelujah. Amen.